Okay, welcome uh, everybody. Uh, I'm Wim de Meijer, Managing Director uh, of ATIS. And on uh, behalf of ATIS, IDSA and TNO, uh, a warm welcome to all of you. Um, we had uh, 180 people who registered uh, from all over the world, basically representing 30 uh, telecom operators and many suppliers. Uh, and we have uh, participants from all over the world. So uh, for some of you, it may be very early or very late, uh, but a, a warm welcome uh, and thanks for uh, being with us. Perhaps we can first have a look at uh, the agenda. We'll briefly introduce also ATIS. And then uh, we will start the, the keynote speakers uh, sessions. We will uh, start with Marcos from IDSA, uh, who will um, outline the uh, IDS uh, standards uh, for sovereign data sharing. Then we're very happy to have Chris from DT, uh, who will um, discuss the use case uh, um, in Germany uh, on mobility. Uh, we're also very happy to uh, have Cookie from uh, NTT Japan in the call, uh, who will uh, discuss uh, the test bed uh, they have set up with uh, Gea X. And uh, we will conclude with Herman from TNO, who will um, give his view uh, and TNO's view on what's in it for the telco, which are the opportunities for uh, data sharing. And we will conclude this session with the Q&A. So feel free also to um, to give your questions uh, uh, throughout the session. Uh, please use the, the question uh, tab, uh, which you see on your screen for that. Um, so throughout the, the session, you can post all the questions. Uh, we will take uh, some during the presentations and also uh, in the Q&A session at the end. So now coming uh, to uh, who we are, what is that is? We're a platform uh, for sharing knowledge in the European telecom industry. Um, we uh, really want to help our members uh, to enable reaching their strategic objectives and also improving their business performance. Uh, and we do this by sharing uh, industry challenges, opportunities and collaboration uh, possibilities in 17 domains. So we have 17 working groups, which you can see listed uh, here. Uh, I will not uh, go through all of them uh, through uh, this uh, live session, but feel uh, free to check out our activities on our uh, website at this.org or contact me uh, for more information. So I would now uh, like to give the floor to Marcus, who will uh, start uh, um, the webinar by uh, giving the, um, the outline on the IDS standards for sovereign data sharing. Marcus, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody from my side. I'm Marcus Matas, and I'm um, Senior Project Manager in IDSA. And today I would like to uh, present to you, I hope that you see my screen now, the correct one. And uh, today I would like to, to present you um, what international data spaces uh, stands for and what we do towards uh, what we call the prospering data economy. And uh, it's really interesting that uh, today um, I present in this, in this event because we, we consider telecommunication as a very special domain since um, telecommunication companies are involved in so many activities nowadays and uh, in many sectors and also cross-sectorial so uh, with their great experience in uh, specific uh, technologies and uh, areas of how to connect IoT devices and with the great data that um, is available uh, through their infrastructure they can play a so important role in, in the data space and data sharing endeavors and um, yeah, it's 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 great that we're going to see also today some some examples of what kind of roles uh, these companies could play in 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 a data space. So um, when talking about data data economy, uh, it's 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 very closely linked to 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 data sharing. It's it's data sharing. It's the only way to create vital ecosystems. Uh, when data become available uh, to to more 
companies and people to to maximize the the value of them and we as IBSA uh, we have done some some groundwork on um, putting some some trust on this data sharing so that this can scale and this is something that we do in the last six years as my 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 colleague um, Andreas presented uh, before we are a non-profit organization and we are uh, have uh, more than 130 members representing uh, all different domains, tech companies, IoT platforms, telecommunication companies, of course, and uh, some specialist uh, companies that uh, contribute to this sovereign data sharing concept that we have come up with. And um, I believe that this is a great uh, point in time to to talk about um, um, yeah data spaces because this year is is the year that we're gonna see uh data spaces come to life uh so a few years ago data spaces was a term that uh, wasn't used that often it wasn't that known when this uh journey began from from idsa but since uh 2019 and the european strategy for data this has been um uh, really uh, has gained interest and uh, it's uh, definitely something that uh, we need to work on on, on how, how to realize the European data spaces that the European data strategy announced the need for. So um, how we will make sure that uh, from our side um, we will insert trust in in this um, in this uh, in this term, and uh, we're gonna make uh, the the um, availability of large pool of data uh, possible uh, through uh, also um, people having um, uh, a governance mechanism that they can trust on uh, about how their data is used. So uh, what we have come up with on that, and this is uh, what I was referring to as our groundwork, is that uh, we have a reference architecture model that uh, enables everyone to participate in a data space. So um, we enable parties to exchange data with each other. And we define for that some, some clear rules that um, allow um, certain trust to be to be provided and we uh, also provide a kind of identity management services that um, give everybody the um, the the trust that it, it's needed to know that the the other person and the other companies uh, is is trustworthy and um, can can be um, can exchange data with so um this is um of course what we contribute from our side with the Jefferson architectural model and we're going to see also later some examples on how this um looks like in reality so uh even though it looks complicated on, on screen uh this is this is a data space we have some some connectors which is a key component through which the data um travels from from one endpoint to the other and uh, we learned from the data strategy uh, that uh, there needs to be data spaces in key sectors. And we saw how we can insert trust just as, as, uh, with these three key um, things that we insert in the data spaces. So, um, but this is only one data space. And uh, in the future, we're gonna have uh, thousands of them, thousands of use cases where two or more parties are uh, exchanging data and uh, the the thing is that this uh, use cases um, will um, this this data spaces are overlapping nested so companies um, need to be able to to uh, move from one data spaces to the other uh, in an easy way and uh, this is I think the, the beauty of the data space is that they are agile and vital uh, and they consist of many data points and um, our duty is to to, um, to find the ways to, to mess them up and uh, uh, to um, insert also trust. So uh, since this is only uh, one data space and uh, 
we, we see the, the, the European strategy for data for the nine sectors, we have to make sure that the data space that we build are built alike. So they are follow some, some common design principles so that uh, we can really enlarge the, the data pool and uh, really benefit from uh, all the cross-sectorial cross um, uh, yeah, exchange of data. So um, this, uh, in, a, in a data space, um, this design principles um, have to do with, with different uh, parts of, of data space because this is the, the look of the data space, right? So uh, we have a data provider and data consumer that they're interested to exchange data. Basically, the consumer would like to, to get the data from the provider. And we have some very generic components for this to happen. We have the information model that defines how um, the data are, uh, are um, uh, exactly understood from, from, the, from the two um, parties. And we have the usage policy on how the data should be used. That is really key. And we have other components like the broker uh, that uh, one can search for data and the certification that uh, makes sure that uh, the the other person uh, is is trustworthy. And uh, next to to the basic components, we we have some some domain specific that for each of the domains like manufacturing and healthcare and mobility, um, we have a common understanding. So we have the, the vocabularies where entities can, can define how exactly um, data is, is um, let's say, um, understood. But uh, in also the domain level, we need to make sure that the data can also be understood outside this domain in, in other domains. And then uh, we have more specific uh, activities uh, when we're talking on, on a use case level in a specific area of manufacturing, for example, where a data space needs to have specific data analytics services that can be um, in in the app store um, uh, services that that uh, can be provided in a data space. So for all these, um, we need to create convergence uh, that makes sure we need to in order to create convergence, we need to make sure that the data spaces that will be created, the many of them. Uh, follow the same rules and uh, for this we have built a kind of uh, some generic building blocks uh, around um, four main pillars which are uh, the interoperability that we need to insert, the trust, we need to make sure that there is the, the real value of data is, is created and of course the governance that uh, controls uh, the, the process in a way that it shows um, that it's uh, this data space is, is uh, um, yeah governed and uh, can be um, used um, from 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 its users uh, in the way they want to to use it. Um, and this is exactly what we do uh, at IDSA uh, in in a level that uh, we 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 um, have a, a defined uh, how 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 data space not only being built but how they can uh, be run so um, because at the end uh, we won't have um, data spaces that would be monolithic and uh, with centralized IT infrastructure but we will have um, uh, interoperable implementation of data space let's call them that so they will they will be uh, complying with uh, a set of agreements in terms of functionality technical uh, operational agreements legal aspects and so on so uh, we we call this soft infrastructure and it, it basically makes sure that um, its data space uh, has some some key uh, things that they need to um, requirements regarding interoperability uh, findability the security trustworthiness for example the maintenance that will make sure for the users that um, we know how how the data space is used, and that this is the the, the standard will be maintained uh, in in the future. So uh, this uh, are um, some things that um, 
um, the will make sure that uh, the data space will not only be built but will be able to to run smoothly and uh, create this convergence between uh, different data spaces that will be created so that can enable companies to move as i said before from data spaces to from one to another and so on and um yeah and exactly this is what we've uh, we've um try to to together with uh, more than 40 organizations uh from from europe try to put in in a position paper that was published some weeks ago on the design principles for data spaces that uh, will create this this uh, scaling um potential and uh will enable data space to be created in the same way so um we actually uh, as i said before call all of this uh, as, as soft infrastructure, the the the, the um, data spaces that uh, will work uh, based on this set of agreements that uh, will be in place. And um, yeah, this this is basically uh, where we, as IDSA, uh, provide uh, our um, uh, three key things, uh, which is the open reference architecture um for um for the data sovereignty uh part on on how data can be exchanged and uh, we also ensure that the, the trust framework uh for data sharing with uh through um yeah describing some central services also like certification as uh, the fundamental part of uh, what we call the soft infrastructure and uh, we have the rule book that defines also this this uh, trust framework so um this is basically um uh sorry for that what we have in this this uh, design principles for data spaces and uh, i want to close a bit with with relating it to what i was uh discussing in the beginning regarding the different roles that uh, telco companies could play here so um this is again the the um the data spaces as, as it looks uh in 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 a way and it would look only always the same in terms of uh, what what components it consists of and here uh, telcos have uh, very different opportunities uh, since they contribute to many different sectors to play the roles of uh, for example the um the data broker, the, the data intermediary that manages uh, data exchanges, the data ecosystem. So uh, the role uh, knows the participants and it can control uh, how one can find data of the other and how this can be stored upon demand and uh, how the metadata about the data can be saved. And um, this is uh, very important because uh, we can see that um, there are so many different roles that, that the companies that have this, uh, this experience of, uh, of storing and managing IoT data can play. And um, yeah, we will see in, in next, uh, to, after my presentation, some, some nice examples of this uh, cross-sectorial uh, data exchange. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm really happy um, to to hopefully that I gave you uh, a nice overview of what we stand for as IDSA and how we, we try to contribute to the self-determined way of exchanging data. And yeah, I'm, I'm just closing with this um, statement of let's build data spaces, but uh, let's follow common design principles that we make our life easier. And uh, when data spaces grow can simply connect to each other and make this a, a bigger pan-european or international data spaces where data can be exchanged freely for everybody thank you very much okay thank you uh, marcos uh, for this very good uh, overview of the uh, ids standard and like you've mentioned uh, it's always good to see uh, real life uh, use cases based uh, on standards and uh, so that's uh, why we are very happy to have uh, Chris uh, Schleuter Langdon from DT, uh, who will uh, present the mobility use case uh, used by the Hamburger Hofbahn. 
so I think we will now uh, swap to the presentation of, uh, of Chris. Yeah, there it is, Chris, the floor is yours. Don't uh, forget to ask questions via the, uh, the question uh, tab uh, on your screen. Um, and um, now uh, I give the floor to, to Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. Can you guys actually hear me loud and clear? Is that possible? Yes, we can. Very good, very good. Can you also see my screen? Yes, but it's not in presentation Wonderful. mode yet. I haven't switched that on yet, but you do see the first slide. Wonderful. So let me switch over to presentation. Yeah, thanks again, actually. It's really a pleasure being here today. Um, so this talk is about, it's, it's about data spaces, and specifically it is about how can, how can business users benefit, and even more specifically, how can a particular sector, the mobility sector, benefit from it? Uh, I'm with the Deutsche Telekom. I'm currently in the unit IoT. My responsibility on data analytics and mobility. And so you always wonder, a telecom company, you know, what what they they have to do with this particular topic, right? And but no surprise because telecom has been involved in in the automotive business for quite some time. Uh, T Systems it has a dedicated unit. Uh, it's T Systems is a B2B a unit of Deutsche Telekom and is specifically focused in helping large enterprises to be successful in that space. And Telekom has been the number one ICT provider for the auto business in Germany for more than a decade. And examples include low-cost trackers to running critical infrastructure such as connected car services, backend systems, but also road charging toll systems, and now new offerings to facilitate the transformation of the auto business toward probably one that is a lot more connected, that is electrified, and that may actually be autonomous. So we are very active in that space as a telecom company to begin with. We have even our own dedicated unit to focus on mobility solutions. And and so the unit that, that I'm currently involved with and, and trying to uh, drive forward uh, is referred to as the data intelligence hub. And this is a for-profit entity. We're not an R&D outfit, but we're a for-profit entity. And uh, roughly we offer three types of services or component. And the first one refers to supermarket systems or data exchange systems. So the vision is that at some point in time, it makes sense to be more organized about data internally and even between companies. And instead of reinventing you know, your, own, your own system, the idea is you just, as you subscribe to a website and configure your website, you can go here and, you know, get your data supermarket so you can put your data products on the shelf, so to speak. That's one core offering. The second offering is once you have those data repositories organized, once you want to exchange data, and this is where IDS comes involved. So we have a dedicated offering that is focused on data sharing with IDS sovereignty. And then the third one is, it's, it's kind of a complementary offering, so we offer also a cloud-based analytics workspace. You can work on your data, refine the data, but you can also work on algorithmic solutions that use then the data in order to create business benefits. And, and in my area, we actually have a dedicated microsite. You may take a look at that, where we have a series on economics of data and also mobility uh, of data. So let me then quickly jump forward. What I want to want to briefly talk about, and I have about like a 15, 15 minutes or so time to to give you like a first-hand experience from the field. Um, so let me talk a little bit about data spaces overall in mobility and automotive, and then I want to zoom in one particular example that goes by the name of Real Lab, Real World Laboratory in Hamburg. Hamburg is Germany's uh, second largest city. It's in the northern part of Germany, and that's a project that is anchored with the, the, the key uh, public transportation uh, provider. It's The name is Hamburger Hochbahn. So they cover anything from bus service all the way to subway services. And then I want to actually look at a little bit deeper into it and look at our solution in particular. And if time permits, I would literally like lift the hood and let us look a little bit into the engine compartment and see indeed, what does it really look like? IDS at work in mobility uh, generating business, business benefits. So let me start out with the first one, data spaces. What is overall the motivation? of a data space in that auto mobility space? Well, the starting point is that we finally all recognize that traffic is a bad thing, right? It's a waste of time, a terrible waste of time. 
Uh, it's polluting the environment and it's very, very noisy. Now, how do we do that? We have to reduce traffic. How do we reduce traffic? Sharing, you know, even literally sharing the different vehicles, right? And from a business perspective, from a business model perspective, that is often also phrased as Uberization. So how do you create a service offering by using existing assets, right? And and so something similar is envisioned for traffic overall. And within it, the key mechanism would be actually to shift, particularly commuters, out of their vehicles into other means of transportation. That's typically referred to as the modal shift. And, and one, one particular instrument here is intermodal mobility. So the idea is how can we link up different modes of transportation to get people from A to point B faster, better, and ideally also cheaper, right? Because if we look at that commute times today, we sit in a car, you know, people have to cruise around the block multiple times to find parking, and then there's a walk, and so maybe there's a way actually to get from it and be better, maybe with micro mobility, right? I hop on a scooter, scoot to a subway station, get on a subway, get out on the other end and use a shared bicycle, and I arrive. So for that though to happen, for that though to happen, um, for modes of transportation and to be shared, well, data has to be shared, right? And not just across the vehicle, but also across the companies, the entities providing those modes of transportation, those vehicles. And the big problem that we've been running into um, is that well, most often they're competing with each other. And why would competitors share data with each other? So this is kind of the, the, the hard problem um, that we have been looking at. And one solution is now to use a data space. What is the data space? I'm using here an, an, a diagram to illustrate the GAIA-X, the effort of a pan-European hypercloud initiative um, that made data spaces very, very popular. And the core idea is that a data space that is facilitated by some, some, and let me call them now federation services, by some new type of infrastructure that is sitting on top of existing existing uh, hyperscaler uh, cloud environments such as AWS and Azure, and that then facilitates a data space, which then in turn will enable new applications that rely on data sharing, just, just as this example of intermodal mobility. Um, and I'm gonna illustrate it here in a way because the example that I wanna dive into at Real Labo Hamburg will actually be exactly of that type. Um, but before I go there, let me just briefly give an overview of our, of our activities. Uh, we started a while back actually, and by now I already have a very rich portfolio of activities you know, in, in that space in particular. So I, I was involved in co-founding the mobility community with the IDSA. I'm also involved in GAIX and the domain mobility of the German National Hub, and we use that in order to drive research in that area. So I'm involved in a funding project GAIX for AI, artificial intelligence, uh, we got involved with an effort kickstarted by the German government, NPM, the National Platform Future of Mobility, um, to identify what are kind of the key data infrastructure policy requirements for new connected mobility solutions. And this OREL app that I just referred to um, has been created out of NPM in order to stop talking and start doing, right? So the idea is that all those ideas on data, on business concepts, infrastructure requirements, and possible policy measures should be put to a test. Uh, and, and this is what is happening actually in, 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 in this real lab effort. And this is the one I'm gonna dive into. Uh, but in the meantime, we have actually seen other, other projects evolve. For example, uh, the German government is sponsoring its own data space, the very first open data space, also focused on mobility and with heavy involvement from um, IDSA and Fraunhofer Institutes. We're also involved in this. We're involved in this consulting operations and we provide use cases uh, for that particular effort. And there's also the very first, the very first uh, public tender that required IDS and it is to rebuild the German National Access Point for mobility data. Uh, that's a project that we're undertaking. And then the last one that just got added like three months ago is the coming together of, of the German auto business in a company driven effort um, that is called Catena X. A little bit example about that. Um, it got launched in March uh, of this year with the Federal Minister of Economic Affairs 
uh, together with the president of the Automotive Industry Association Germany and some some um, uh, CEOs of kind of the key companies involved in it. Uh, we are also involved in this. Uh, it's a CEO level involvement. Uh, CEO Tim Hutkus uh, has been driving that particular effort, and we've been grateful actually to 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 implement it at an operational level. Um, Oh, but this is kind of an overview of, of, of where we're coming from uh, and, and engaging with this. Uh, now let me let me let me take a look and into the um, let me take a look into one second. I mean, let me take a look into what we do actually in Hamburg. The, this project was also funded like NPM. It came out of NPM. NPM is as based on the contract of the coalition parties in Germany, and they ask the Minister of uh, Transport and Digital Infrastructure to take care of this. That's what he did. And under his auspices, this real lab project was created, was attached to Hamburg with Hamburger Hochbahn operating this, this massive project. So we started out with it. And the overall idea is to use Hamburg as an example to find out to what extent can we actually trigger a modal shift. Um, this is your material it's taken from the Hamburger Hochbahn. It'll in, it's indicating that in, 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 in 2017, if you look at the outer ring, like about 22% of all trips in, in Hamburg are conducted using public transportation. Uh, the, the, the vast majority is actually using own vehicles. So, and the key idea in the city is actually to to boost this share from 22 to 30. It doesn't sound like much, but that's a massive actually, massive undertaking. And so the so the project that we proposed, that we proposed was to use IDS technology to facilitate data sharing, which then in turn can enable new business models. And to make it very specific, we picked actually one, one new, and that is intermodal. And and we're not just talking about it, but what we do is we're building we're building a demonstrator. So the idea is actually to have an app that that can be used, right? So it's not by by, by ordinary people, but you know for for people in this project and and maybe selected users. Um, this should be a full functional application uh, that'll help users to plan an intermodal journey. And the starting point will be in Hamburg, and the destination will be in Berlin. And a model means that we can have different modes of transportation for the various segments of the trip. So typically we have a first mile and there's a last mile and then there is something in between. And here we even no, no, just have a first mile in one municipality, Hamburg, but we have to connect this one city with another city, Berlin. Berlin is the largest German city. So we're connecting here the two largest German cities with each other. Now, in order to make the seamless experience, though, right, we have to we have to connect. We have to connect multiple multiple providers in here. Um, and it sounds easy. It is not, unfortunately. In order to make it very convincing for the customer, for one customer, the the really hard problem is that ultimately whoever is going to then offer this particular intermodal trip has to get those participating companies to share customer data. And that is typically considered the most valuable data that we have. Why would anybody share data on customers, right? Well, the only answer is very obvious, and that is if it's better, right? If it, if it makes sense for business, if it's if it's a win-win scenario here, right? And and so and that's exactly the setup we're looking at. So we've been also been doing together with the university. We've been running simulation studies. We've been We've been running simulation studies on intermodal travel. What we find out is that, yes, the good news is done right, you can actually be faster. You can be much faster actually than traditional modes of transportation. So, so from a user, from a citizen perspective, it will be huge value in this, right? Huge value to use intermodal there. Now, from a provider perspective, providers we're talking about, right? Providers, you know, let's say of micromobility, public service, Right, you know, or other you know related transportation, often like new on-demand shuttles, for example, they would also benefit because you know we want to move people out of the individual vehicles, right? That's where the money would come from, from use of individual vehicles. Actually, all the other providers would benefit if they would share. Actually, they would be looking at more. The fact that we don't have intermodal, well, 
lets people just continue to use their vehicles, right? So it's a lost revenue and profit opportunity for all the other mobility providers. So here it is. So we do have a win-win setting, right? That only has to be unleashed. And the way to unleash is if we find a way for those companies to trust a data transaction on customer data. And this is where IDSA comes in. So IDS in a nutshell is a technology that allows for a data transaction to be trusted between parties that do not trust each other, right? These are competitors and that won't change, right? That won't change at all. But what has to happen is that they can trust a particular uh, relationship. And, and we can talk about it all day long. So what we wanted to do is actually, we wanted to actually uh, prove it. Now let me just give a little, a little peek into it. Um, and so what we did is we have in this in this particular demonstration, we have actually two components, right? We have, so to speak, the front end as a user interface where we configure a trip A, B, where do you want to go? What are your preferences and so on? And then we have another component that, that sits under it that's enabling it. And and because um, we don't have much time, so we, we do have a front end interface um, that, that, that I could demo here and that will be a live one. But what, what's it under it? Under it, what we have done is actually we created in a testbed setting. We have a testbed installed for our for our project. And what we have done is we have created, so to speak, a minimum viable data space. So we installed, we have one organization, we have another organization, and that one organization is hooking it to its system with customer data, and the other organization is hooking into its system with, with customer data. And the use case that we have is very, very simple. Let's pretend I'm a user. I want to book a ticket on a platform. And there are platforms. Hamburg has a platform. Hamburg Open has a platform called Switch, right? Um, or Berlin. Also, the, the public transport right, has a platform. It's called Yelby. But why would I, why would I book a trip on one of those platforms if they won't recognize that the micro mobility provider that, I, that have an existing membership with one of the micro mobility providers that I pick on their platform, right? I wouldn't use the platform, right? I'm going to pay more, right? So the platform should know that I have a membership with the micro mobility provider that I plan to use in this intermodal journey. I want to use a scooter to get to the subway, right? So I need those both. And I wouldn't buy it from Amagorupa on the ticket if it wouldn't recognize on its platform my existing membership with Tia, which gives me discounted scooter pricing. So so here it is. So the one organization, Amagorupa, and and uh, so the, the, their platform essentially they would be kind of a consumer setting they would need customer data from here or vice versa they would have to share customer data on humble Group on so this is this is all well the setup and we were able to implement it we implemented it so we implemented connectors there were some supporting infrastructure the previous video I talked about there are a few more components that are going to install in order to allow for a connector to connector interaction and then we added something into it that is referred to as a usage policy right the usage policy is a means that allows us actually to control not just this particular transaction but it also controls how the data actually can be used in it um, and let me actually try and see whether I can have you take a little bit under the under the hood here and show you the last part of it, or let me actually do that before we do it. But I want to demonstrate is we're going to demonstrate now an interaction between two connectors, right? Representing two organizations, so one of the platform, the other one, another mobility provider. And the one wants to know something about an existing customers. Now, in order to make it trustworthy, this usage policy has been designed to let the one party grab the payload data only once. After that, no more data data transfer possible, right? And let me see whether I can find actually this in the code. Let me go quickly to the point. And so we go through this particular scenario. There are multiple steps that have to be conducted. And then I want to show you one particular sequence the application of one particular usage policy that we that we run. Let me just play this here. Let me see whether I can see something. There's a lot of code going on, of course, here. But and so 
So what we see here is now actually that that one data transfer is is being enabled. Let me just go there real quick. Let me see whether I can grab it. So here's customer data. You can see that is actually sensitive customer data, name information, discount situation with that customer is being transferred. And now we want what we do is there's a policy restriction is in place as defined in the policy. Oh, that was already too fast. Let me see one more back. So what we see here is already the end result where the second attempt to use the payload data one more time is actually being denied because, because what we had implemented in this particular setup was a so-called end time usage policy provided in the IDS setup. So that's about, that's about it. Um, that was a quick peek under the hood. So I gave the broad overview, it's umbrella portfolio, a lot of activities in mobility. Um, and then within the one project, Real Lab, I try to demonstrate how we, how IDS technology and usage policy in particular can enable a win-win business scenario that has so far been prevented by the lack of trust in a particular data transaction here. And back to you, Ben. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chris, uh, for a very inspiring uh, presentation and a, a great use case. I think uh, we're all uh, looking for better mobility uh, in our countries. So uh, I hope this one uh, uh, will uh, will be successful. Um, and um, another uh, question um, we have with data sharing is obviously also cross-border uh, data exchange. Uh, and that's why we are very happy that we have uh, Kuki uh, Mitani here from uh, NTT in Japan, uh, who is working on a test bed to connect uh, Gea X to European uh, smart uh, data platforms. Uh, so, um, Kuki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. So my name is Koki Mitani, a senior research engineer of NTT Corporation. Uh, today I would like to talk about connecting connecting Gaia X to smart data platform with trust. The main topic is cross-border data exchange. So my name is Koki Mitani. Uh, NTT is the uh, largest Japanese telecom company and Software Innovation Center is one of the uh, research and development division of NTT Group. And my, I'm working on making the research and development strategy for building data ecosystem. And also working on international and cross-industry collaboration. So in 8th of April this year, uh, NTT Communications is uh, published the news release. The, it is the entity communications prototype platform securely shares CO2 emission related data from Switzerland to sites in Germany and Japan. And we have implemented IDS connector into this system and share the data from Switzerland to Japan and Germany. And this uh, news is referred from IDSA's website. Today, I would like to talk about the background of this activity and detail about this implementation and uh, uh, future activities. So from this slide, I would like to explain about the background of our activity. The expectations for digitalization of intercompany operations are growing. The digital transformation of businesses in various industries is accelerating. And the digital, digitalization of internal operations performed within individual companies 
is gradually progressing. But digitalization of intercompany operations is not progressing as desired. If the digitalization of entire businesses, including intercompany operations, will promote uh, the growth of the economy and reduce the risks faced by the society. However, there are several challenges that we need to overcome. For example, the first one is the company's data cannot be shared with other companies because of risks that important data and business secrets could be exposed. And the second one is it is impossible to check who will use the company's data and how they will use it when sharing data with other companies. And third one is it is impossible to check if data provided by other companies is accurate and if it is generated by legitimate means or whether it benefits for one's own company. And fourth one is there are many IoT platforms, but ID systems and data are siloed for each industry, each purpose, and each company. So from this slide, I would like to explain about uh, what NTT Group is doing. As a part of NTT Group's Your Value Partner Business Initiative, we are leveraging our diverse corporate resources, including our research and development facilities, ICT platforms, and human resources to promote a digital transformation while collaborating with our partners with the aim of solving society's issues. Last year, NTT has proposed the concept, a global data infrastructure for data sharing between businesses. In this concept, NTT Software Innovation Center is working on intertrust technology for the mutual sharing of data in trusted areas. This technology enables the sharing of data to business users while maintaining the data sovereignty of the data provider. Please look at this picture. On the left side, there are two data provider companies. On the right side, there is a data user company and our system manages the agreement of data sharing between data provider and data user. And our system manages the workflow of application and approval of data sharing. And our system applies data sharing conditions to directly to the data flow, which is shown in the, uh, this picture by red arrows. And also this system provides the management of data sharing conditions and data sharing history. Uh, some of these technologies are already commercialized by entity communications. It is one of the, our entities operating company. And they are providing smart data platform as a data infrastructure. And in, on top of this platform, they are providing the software. It is called WizTrust. And in this, is trust software uh, they are planning to uh, they are now providing the secure and trusted data sharing uh, by using the intertrust technology by using the intertrust technology and smart data platform we would like to support uh, building a trusted data sharing community for solving both social and industrial issues not just supporting data sharing between two companies, but we would like to support building trusted data sharing community. And for realizing the resilient value chain and circular economy. And also we would like to support uh, main, uh, the companies who want to unlock the value of data sharing. So if the company have the data set for their business, we think that, that that data set can be used for multiple purposes, uh, such as customer value creation, uh, business process optimization, business risk mitigation, and sustainable development. 
And from this slide, I would like to explain two use cases of the cross-border data sharing. First one is international joint experiment for global data infrastructure for data sharing between businesses. NTT has joined in the Lighthouse Industry 4.0 project in Switzerland Innovation Park, BLBN. And we have conducted the experiments to visualize CO2 emissions across manufacturing processes with the aim of transforming into a low carbon and circular economy. We have built a system which accumulates energy consumption within the whole supply chain and share the amount of CO2 emission with the customer by connecting the entity's data sharing system, uh, which enables the management of data sharing agreement and data communication across the whole supply chain. And this slide shows the uh, data flow of this experiment. First, the customer orders the customized product uh, by a website. And that order will be sent to the production processes, which is operated by uh, different companies. And on the right side, uh, the entity's global data infrastructure collects data from each production process from each company. And uh, in this data sharing, we have applied the data, con uh, data sharing condition for secure and trusted uh, data sharing. And after that, uh, we had the, uh, aggregated the energy consumption data and calculate the CO2 emission, uh, the amount of CO2 emission, and provide it uh, as a CO2 emission certificate for the customer of that product. And from now, uh, uh, after uh, doing that experiment, uh, we, we are planning to expand this activity. And uh, next, we would like to uh, start the new use case for realizing circular economy, uh, because we think that realization of circular economy can be accelerated by secure and trusted data sharing across industries. Uh, in this picture, on the left side, there is the flow of biological materials. On the right side, there is a circular flow of technical materials. And from uh, as a next experiment, we are planning to use the, this uh, right side flow, the remanufacturer flow. Uh, we would like to collect data from supply chain and also uh, reuse that data for remanufacturing. This is the uh, current plan for next POC. Uh, from this slide, I would like to explain about second use case. Second use case is about uh, directly to the cross-border data sharing. For cross-border data sharing, uh, we need to consider about the global trends in data sharing between businesses and businesses, governments, and international organizations around the world are increasingly involved in discussions of strategies, architectures, in order to promote innovation through data sharing. However, concerns are being raised about the risk of data being placed under the control of platform operators or data being used by national authorities. So we think that we need a mechanism for guaranteeing security and data trust. For data sharing between businesses, it is important to have security functions that protect against cyber attacks. And also it is important to have the functions that protect the data sovereignty of data providers in accordance with laws and regulations. And in Europe, uh, last uh, in October 2019, the governments of Germany and France announced the concept of a data infrastructure. It is called Gaia X. And in the data ecosystem part, the blue part of uh, this picture of Gaia X, uh, we are very uh, uh, they are planning to use 
uh, the IDS, International Data Space for Data Sharing, and they are planning to use IDS Connector uh, for data sharing inside the data space. And the IDS Connector connects devices, edges, and clouds, and it provides access control and usage control of data according to loads and contracts. And this concept is very similar to the activities of NTT in Japan. So uh, we have conducted the experiment of the interconnection uh, between European GAIA-X and NTT Communications Smart Data Platform by using IDS connector. In this April, NTT has connected uh, Switzerland Innovation Park and Frankfurter IDS Laboratory in Germany and NTT's data platform in Japan uh, by using the IDS standard that supports data sovereignty in the GAIA-X data ecosystem. We have sent, uh, in, in Switzerland, we have the equipment uh, like a factory and uh, we have sent the data from 3D printer uh, in Switzerland to the Japan and to Japan and Germany by using the IDS connector. And we have applied the data usage control policy into the IDS connector in the center of this, uh, this picture. And from now, uh, we are planning to build an international cross industry data sharing test bed. Uh, in this summer, we are planning to launch this test bed. Uh, by connecting the uh, Japanese infrastructure and German data, data center of the NTT. And also we are planning to connect to Switzerland Innovation Park and the IDS laboratory. And using the IDS standard, uh, we are building the uh, large test bed uh, for verifying, verifying the practicality and operability of a mechanism that can properly control the rights to use each data based on roads and contracts. And uh, we need partner for collaborating, uh, collaborating for verify and verify the practicality and operability in various domains. And we think that we need collaboration. Uh, diverse challenges must be overcome to solve social problems and to realize sustainable development and circular economy. And no single country and no single company can overcome them all. So we aim to collaborate and grow with companies, communities, and governments around the world who are working to resolve similar issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kuki, uh, for this uh, very inspiring presentation uh, containing use cases in manufacturing and also uh, uh, opening up cross-border data sharing and thank you also for your uh, proposal to to collaborate this is also uh, what atis uh, wants to to help to do within the european uh, telecom um, sector and uh, that's a good transition and also to our next speaker, uh, because uh, let's look now at opportunities for telecom operators uh, in, uh, the, um, in the IDS uh, standard. Um, and uh, Herman Pals will uh, give uh, the TNO view on uh, which opportunities uh, are present for us telcos uh, in this space. Herman, the floor is yours. I think, Herman, you're still on mute. Yes. Ah, there you are. Go ahead. And do you see my screen? Show. Not in presentation mode. Uh, okay. No, then that's then I make because I don't see my own screen. That's that's annoying. <laughs> It's the screen. Do you see the screen? We see the screen, but it's um, not the the presentation mode. We see all your slides and uh, the first slide in the uh, in a bigger That's size. Of course, I set it now on presentation mode. Maybe it's somewhat slower. But... 
it's still like that. Of course, it's in my it's in presentation mode. So. Well, if not, you can use it like this. I think. Uh, I agree. Uh, anyhow, visible. the presentation will be made available afterwards. Yes, we will uh, make. Uh, yeah. Um, thanks for the introduction, Wim. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Hemel Pals. Uh, I'm co-host of this session, and in fact, I brought together uh, Wim de Meijer and uh, and the EDSA because I think uh, uh, I have a background in telecommunications. Worked for 20 years in the telecommunications, where I also know uh, ATIS quite well. And uh, since two years, I'm overall responsible for the data sharing uh, portfolio and where I have also an active role in the uh, IDSA. And uh, I think uh, data sharing and making data spaces is a great opportunity for telecom operators. We already saw uh, that both uh, Deutsche Telekom T-Systems as well as NTT is busy in this area. And I think there are more opportunities for, for telecom operators in this world. I'm working at uh, TNO. TNO ICT is a large research and development institute in the Netherlands. And we have about 300 people working in the ICT uh, area. And uh, our role in, uh, in data sharing is mainly, say, to overcome all the barriers, both on the, on the legal and uh, trust uh, related uh, topics as well as sharing related like uh, data interoperability and also to ensure that the end-to-end -end quality is uh, ensured in the value. So how can you make value when bringing data together? And we are actively uh, both contributing to standardization activities like uh, it's going on in the IDSA as well actively building ecosystems, mainly in the Netherlands in uh, making proof of concepts pilots to uh, ensure that there will be operational solutions. And the good news is some of those uh, solutions are now already operational. I will come back to that uh, later. We are very, as mentioned, very active in the IDSA. Uh, my director is a board member of the IDSA. Uh, we are actively contributing uh, in the deliverables, as Marcos showed in the first uh, presentation. And we also set up proof of concepts and pilots, for instance, in the industri industrial area, I think with similar examples as Entity uh, showed, optimizing supply chains and uh, that's in smart connected supply networks and also in the logistics area uh, area we are very active in uh, facilitating uh, data sharing solutions Herman, may i interrupt yeah. you very briefly we can only see your first slide and uh, therefore i think we have to find a solution for this presentation issue maybe you could um you are working with two um with two screens right and yeah. you could maybe switch the presentation switch up, uh, the screens you can in, in in powerpoint you can make a setting that the presentation mode is shown in the other screen on the other screen what do you see now do you see this it's still the same Oh, you could just even go to the work mode but there and, and go there. The screen is closed. What do you see? Yeah, now we have slide number five. Yeah. And if I put it. And now also now, in the large. Now it's presentation mode. That works. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thanks for the interruption. Um, what does it mean for uh, for telecom operators? I think that's uh, the important questions. And uh, when I, based on my history in uh, in telecommunications, telecom operators already have a long history in secure data sharing within companies. Uh, say in the in the previous century, it was mainly leased lines, and during the last 10, 50 years, they moved to VPN services. So they already have a long history in secure data sharing, but within companies. And I think that currently it's the next wave is secure data exchange between companies and uh, which have many implications about trust, which was also mentioned with uh, 
Deutsche Telekom and NTT. It mostly, sometimes it's simply competitors. You only want to do it uh, once in an aggregated way. So it should be very much controlled. And there already during the last 10 years, there are many initiatives uh, uh, in spe sector specific solutions in sharing data in some way, but mostly they are not standardized and they have a small scale and it's difficult to upscale while my belief and also uh, 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 underpin say that data sharing will more and more say within sectors but also uh, across sectors where standardization is really needed and as you know we made a study uh, at the end of last year also uh, depicting all the different initiatives and all the different technologies and uh, that study also proved that IDSA is, uh, say, based on the current uh, information, the best way to go. I uh, have a link to that uh, overall uh, exercise, um, and I will make it available in the chat uh, later on, uh, because I used some slides of that uh, study uh, showing the benefits of data sharing and also, say, the current status. Uh, but I think one of the key message is that uh, this is simply the next wave of secure data exchange from within companies to between uh, companies. And I think for telecom operators, they have an excellent role because they are working across all those different uh, sectors. And the good news, because uh, I know the telecom operators uh, as well, is there any money involved? The good news is, say, uh, the hockey, hockey stick curve is, uh, is uh, growing and more and more, I am really expecting in the next five years that this will be a growing and interesting market also for telecom operators. And I really think that, say, first operators are already moving, like Deutsche Telekom entity, but uh, also some other operators, that also for other operators, it's, it's now time to join this initiative and to ensure that you commonly create the cake, but in the end are also part of the cake and having part of the growing revenues. Uh, as already mentioned, say, uh, and uh, depicted in many other presentations, IDS, uh, International Data Space, delivers an excellent framework to uh, build standardized uh, data spaces. And already many companies uh, are involved, uh, both uh, for potential uh, customers as well as providers in this area. And IDS de de develops say, a secure and end-to-end uh, -end, uh, connectivity for a secure data exchange, also uh, enables a trust framework so uh, that you know with whom you are going to share data and that there is a governance uh, uh, applicable uh, in, in that area. And this picture was already mentioned also, I think in various other uh, presentations, there are some basic components. And I think for telecom operators, uh, this is also an excellent way of playing a role in, uh, in this ecosystem. Um, you will always have, say, a data consumer and a data provider. So a party would deliver and is willing to, to sell, or not, uh, say, depending on the business model, to deliver data. And there are parties who want to use that data. And there it's crucial that there is, in the end, there is a secure connection between the data provider and data consumer. It's not necessary. Uh, via uh, an intermediate platform. It can be also uh, a direct uh, connection between those uh, parties. And there are supporting roles uh, like uh, a clearinghouse for the billing, uh, a, a broker server to, uh, provider uh, to, to know, for instance, where can I find which data? Say for telecom, uh, say historically, you have experience in phone books. Of course, also for data, you need the kind of phone book services. And of course, there will be many parties who will deliver uh, additional services on top uh, of uh, the data exchange or can provide. So you can also create a kind of marketplace and an app store uh, provider. And of course, say what's the crucial part is the identity uh, provider and access control to the, uh, to the data. And that's basically say you uh, as a telecom operator you can deliver say a secure access to the data space 
just as you now deliver, say, uh, uh, internet access, but then in this way, in a more uh, restricted way. So for telecom operators, I think why is the crucial role? Uh, there are already some parties starting up, but I think telcos, the benefits of telcos, they perfectly understand those kind of business models. They are working across all kinds of, uh, in, in all sectors. So they can also ensure, because the first wave will be data spaces within a sector, but definitely say, if that's in somewhat the range, there will be a request to have data spaces across sectors. And for instance, logistics is also a part, say, which is highly related to, for instance, industrial parties, because in the end, if you, in the industrial area, you have to bring some of those industrial equipment have to be in a logistic way, move from one part to the other part. And um, so across all sectors, the good news IDS is uh, standardized and what's also showing by, uh, by NTT, uh, there is a high need of interconnecting data spaces. And that's a kind of business where traditional telecom operators have a huge experience in say back end collaboration. Uh, in interconnecting mobile networks, in interconnecting uh, VPNs, and also in this area, uh, interconnecting data spaces will be one of the cornerstone to, to get sufficient scales. And of course, you also can aim at specific uh, roles like identity provider and a broker service providers delivering a marketplace, and also say some uh, services on top of now there operators can differentiate like Deutsche Telekom, they have their own uh, uh, an analytics tools. Yeah, and then you are providing value added services on top of basic services. And uh, I think the good news, uh, it's a, a fast growing uh, ecosystem idea, IDSA. And uh, so there are many parties already uh, involved. And uh, the first implementations of uh, IDS uh, are already uh, almost operational. As you know, we are uh, very much involved in what they call smart connected supply networks, where they optimize, say, the uh, value chain uh, in the industrial area, especially in, uh, in the Eindhoven area. Parties fully realize to stay competitive with the Chinese and uh, American uh, industrial parties, they have a way of collaboration, exchanging information while staying, say, not hiding their competitive uh, information. And by smart connected supply networks, they are far more faster to have, for instance, the specific elements and demands in the, in the demand chains to get better insight what's available to share designs, to do remote maintenance, all kinds of, of use cases which are supported by smart connected supply networks. And in that way, also for operators to match it, say uh, uh, ID, IDS based solutions, it can be done today and uh, certification was not yet mentioned. That will also be available uh, before the end of this year. So, uh, 2021 is really the year to start for telecom operators and to offer commercial services before the end of this year or early next year. And the role of TNO, we set up the, this ecosystem. Uh, we supported in the proof of concepts and pilots. And we also delivered, say, for instance, the IDS connector is, say, the kind of CPU connections to, uh, to data spaces. We deliver that software based on open source and which is also used. Uh, by many parties. And I think currently in the uh, smart connected supply networks already between around 500 or 1000 uh, companies are already attached. So it's fastly growing. So I would say it's time to join uh, as a telecom operator and we are facilitating a, a fast track for telecom operators to come up to speed in the uh, IDS data spaces and especially also focusing, say, at the interconnection and the standardized element. So it's more on, say, the common roadmap and uh, the, uh, the technical exchange. Of course, say, each individual operator can have their own commercial strategy. That's not discussed, but 
uh, back-end collaboration is needed to make it a success. So thanks for your... Okay. Uh, Thank you, Herman, uh, for uh, outlining uh, what's in it for uh, the telecom uh, sector. And uh, I think it's uh, a good time to uh, start the, uh, the Q&A. We didn't have so far that many questions in uh, the channel, I think. We have some. Um, I think one important element is the uh, the billing or the charging on uh, using the data. So obviously this data has a value. Is this uh, one way or another built or um, does the customer uh, who's the owner of the data get something in return? In, uh, in the use cases mentioned, uh, perhaps uh, Cookie and, uh, and Chris can comment on that. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Cookie from NTT. Uh, regarding the uh, the flow of uh, the data and the the payment or something like that, uh, we think that the, it is very important part of the data network and data space uh, because the data can drive the business between companies. So maybe the it is related to the business over the data space. So data and money flow is also. Uh, uh, considered together, but uh, there are many uh, challenges for realizing that. So we we need to work up together uh, mm. for discussing about that. Yeah. So it's depending on the data space, and it needs further discussion. Yeah. Uh, Chris, do you can you comment on it? Yeah, we are currently pursuing what is possible in essence. Um, so we do see an opportunity, of course, you know, for payment infrastructure, for example, but uh, we also believe there are already some opportunities um, that, that, that can be explored and even converted into a true business uh, without a payment infrastructure required. Okay. Uh, there was a question related to uh, ATIS and uh, our role. So we're not um, a marketplace uh, of uh, IDSA. So just to clarify that, perhaps it was confusing uh, when we talked about a platform, but uh, basically we are an association uh, exchanging uh, use cases and best practices among telecom players. So we, we do not have an active role in uh, in sharing uh, data in the sense of uh, the topic of today. So just to make that sure and clear. Um, so I'm not sure we have other questions in the um, in the Q&A uh, yes. channel. We have one Perhaps question. And yeah, I think I'll, this is, this yeah, is a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> So the one question is very simple. Um, um, is the IDS certification um, considered for platforms or for technical providers? So the answer is, um, is a bit different. So components in a data sharing ecosystem can be certified such as a connector, but also organizations can be certified. And uh, but Marcos, I think you are the right one to to give an, a better answer on this. Yeah, Andreas, I think that um, yeah, you already gave the <clears throat> the overview. So this certification is about the the um, parties uh, in a data space that want to exchange the data and how their components and their organizational environment uh, can be certified uh, that uh, from a third. Um, body that uh, they are able to, to share data with uh, the, the trust that we also insert. So it's not for the technical provider that would provide, for example, a service or uh, be a broker, but it's for the participants that want to uh, exchange data. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe Christy again on this one. I, I think if you want to use it internally, I think it'll be all fine. Uh, we've been running into the certification issue, the certification actually being something very desirable, 
when it is about a lot of liability issues between parties, right, and and end users, for example, right. Um, now in those cases, yes, of course, and but this is standard in other industries too, and with, you know, with other types of software, right, and and we already see that, and that's all good news, is that we are treating this not so much anymore as some anomaly, right, you know, something new there. And, and I know that, I mean, for me, it's a rerun of what I've seen actually at the application uh, level. If you go back to around the 2000 or so, the first internet wave, I mean, we had the discussion on federated, federated, loosely coupled system at the application level, right? Web services comes to mind. Microsoft.net, for example, there is something similar now. I think we see something similar now at the data level. We're going to more federated structures. So as we have seen that at the application level, you know, it become business as usual. And I can see it already today that, that, that we've made the big, big move to, you know, so to, so to some extent to some normalization of this thing, right? We treat it more like other pieces of software too. And then of course, certification is being, of course we do this with other components as well. Um, but, but you can do it today actually, right? For internal, and that is being done actually already for, for internal, uh, purposes, you can go ahead and use it. Um, yeah. yeah, so that was just my comment there. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Chris, for that. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, yes, there's another question, uh, also very simple, um, but might not be that simple to answer. What about GDPR restrictions? Um, by the way, I have opened your microphones so dear audience, um, and especially dear Vladimir Mironovs, you have asked this question. Would you open your microphone and, and, and explain a little bit um, your question? What about GDPR restrictions? Our device, like... Yeah, that is open, yeah. Okay. Oh, um... My question about uh, data is um, a lot of data is uh, restricted to use uh, for for business purposes, only for purposes which are uh, initially agreed from the customer side. But uh, if we want to share with the, the data, we have uh, more restrictions. Um, so. I hope that I gave more information. But, uh, now you can answer. Yeah, come on. Maybe uh, I can react. Uh, I fully understand that GDPR for some data sharing, but what we are also very active and we also showed that that is feasible that we are using privacy enhanced technologies just to hide the private information, but do it on a more abstract layer. And for instance, we already performed uh, a pilot in the healthcare sector where it's very say, sensitive data, where we also showed that we could do analytics on top of uh, healthcare data on an IDS-based infrastructure. And um, if you give some time, uh, there is also, say, the, the information is also publicly available on, let's say, also the Dutch AI coalition. And even the software is publicly uh, available on GitHub. But maybe with Wim, I can share that later on, uh, just yeah. showing that those kind of technologies, we are fully aware that GDPR, not everything can be shared, but there are advanced technologies where, for instance, you at least can share or take get patterns out of those uh, sensitive data. Yeah, so um, GDPR is probably sometimes, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a party spoiler. But uh, I think there are ways to to uh, uh, to ha to get around it, and uh, I think it's uh, it's an attention point we have to deal with. Uh, any other comments from uh, from Cookie or uh, or Chris on this? Yeah, I will actually do your to do your party spoiler. I had that same, you know, when I first actually read it, and and we were started to to try to get our arms around it and and translating that into solutions. I had the same opinion. Now I'm actually thinking, you know what, I, I think it may just have the very opposite effect, right? Because now it establishes it actually as a viable business, right? You can actually have, you know, transaction um, of customer data, right? Because now you have those constraints. You're either, you either have to anonymize or you need consent, right? So 
um, it, uh, these are somewhat clear rules suddenly that, that, that can. So if you're in that business, you want to make data, these are clear, clear boundaries, there are clear guidelines that, that, that you can work with. In the past, that, that was not the case, actually. Right? It was like a gray zone, so to speak, actually, right? And so what I, what I think I observe is it had actually legitimized that particular business, too. Um, and uh, from an IDS perspective, well, it's just like any other piece of software, well, we have to observe it, right? And, and I think it lends itself, actually, even to support some of those uh, consent mechanisms to obtain customer consent and make customer consent available actually to other parties. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, so that, that's definitely a positive note to it. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Chris. Um, Andreas, do we have other questions or I do realize that we're uh, at the end of the time foreseen and for many of the people in the audience it's probably lunch time yeah but only in, in in the meantime vladimir kuparin and uh, you have raised your hand but uh put it down again so yeah. if you have a question please free, feel free to answer it uh, to, to uh, ask it maybe it's a comment to this gdpr uh, topic uh, i'm from finland and we have even a a law uh, that says a second for secondary usage of personal data like in health so it's not only um, a constant issue, but also uh, legal, the law should help. And also we have in Europe PSI uh, directives that like uh, demands from public services, for example, to open uh, APIs for, for connection, for sharing the data. So we should think about this. It's not only like uh, initiative, but uh, it's uh, obligation of companies and public services to help citizens to to receive benefits from data sharing. Just a comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Perhaps it's a good time then to uh, to end the uh, the live session. Uh, but before doing that, uh, I would also like to uh, mention that ATIS is organizing a gathering in Rome in October. We will send you an invitation uh, uh, for that. We can definitely uh, discuss the progress on, on what we discussed today uh, over there as well. And then hopefully in a, in a physical way. Uh, so I think everybody is, uh, is a little bit fed up with webinars and uh, live sessions. So hopefully we can start to meet uh, again uh, in person. Um, but before ending uh, this call, uh, I would also like to thank uh, the speakers, uh, Marcus, Chris, Cookie and Herman. And I also want to uh, thank uh, warmly uh, Andreas uh, from IDSA for helping uh, to set this up, uh, as well as Herman from, uh, from TNO, who was also a great help. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the live session. You will get the slides uh, via mail and we will also provide you with a link to the recording we, we have made uh, so you can uh, watch it again or share it with colleagues. Uh, feel free uh, to do so. So thanks a lot. Uh, enjoy lunch or perhaps for Cookie it's dinner probably already uh, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Uh, have a great day. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Bye nice everyone. evening to Japan. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.